Hi, my name is Charles Priest, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Stories of Home. We're here today at historic Falconhurst on the outskirts of McMinnville on Charles Creek, the home of McMinnville industrialist Asa Faulkner, and later the well-known composer Charles Faulkner Bryan. This place is the footprint of both of these men and their families and the influence they had on this community. History is alive in these very places. And, uh, and the armoire, our wardrobe behind mm -hmm. me, is original. This was the Ace of Faulkner furniture. And beautiful uh, walnut wood, solid wall, walnut. And uh, they just didn't have room in their house anywhere to put it, and so they left it, and I was delighted with it. Mm. Wonderful. And this has all been totally redecorated, I can see, and very nicely. I love the fireplace around, and the fireplace looks beautiful. Very nice. There's more to our identity than our DNA. It's not just our genealogy that makes us who we are. It's not just the environment we grew up in, but it's the land we walked on as children, um, as parents. Um, my daughter, when she was little, played in these leaves with my mother, her granny, holding her hand. The, the land makes us who we are as much as anything. Aza Faulkner was born in South Carolina and later immigrated here to McMinnville, Tennessee with his parents. Uh, he eventually grew, grew in prominence uh, in the McMinnville area and became a well-known industrialist and worked in the mills in this area. The mills made use of the historic power of the water flowing through these hills and hollers of Tennessee. Uh, he eventually became the owner of the Faulkner Woolen Mills right here on Charles Creek, where we are today. Uh, he developed a large enough business. They employed a large amount of the community in the McMinnville area. There was even a village of houses nearby where many of the employees lived. Uh, he eventually built a one-room brick office here and that developed into the house you see behind me, which was built in 1850. Like any other businessman, Asa Faulkner needed an office, and that's what's behind us right now, a brick one-room building that served as his office. He was not just the owner of the woolen mills right across the creek here, but this was in the midst of about a 460-acre uh, estate that he owned at the time. So this was his center of business. It's a one-room office and you can see it has a chimney on it providing the source of heat. You can see these bricks right here. These are old bricks, but these look like even older bricks. In all likelihood this was the doorway as this faces Charles Creek and faces his place of business 
right across the water at the woolen mills. So this was very likely the front door of the building that was later turned into a window. And when the rest of the structure was built in the house, it was connected to that house from the other direction. This is the cornerstone of Falconhurst, and you can see right here carved in hand, A.D. 1850. This was carved in the hand of the people that originally built this house. Falconhurst is a rectangular two-story brick house with a gable roof, twin brick chimneys at each gable end, and a sandstone foundation. Completed in 1850 with slave labor, the house shows a transition from the Federal to the Greek Revival style. The Federal style influence is evident in the austere five-bay facade, two-room deep central hallway floor plan, and interior mantelpieces of the house. The Greek Revival influence is seen in the two-tiered portico on the facade and in the side lights and transom of the entrance. Many buildings like this that predate the Civil War did not survive the war. If they belonged to someone of one political persuasion, sometimes the opposite side would come in and destroy it. Even though we're in the South here in Tennessee, Asa Faulkner had Union sympathies. He sympathized with that Union cause, but for some reason this house was not destroyed. Perhaps it's because he was one of the biggest employers in the area. Perhaps it's because the woolen mills were so important because that's how you made uniforms, People had to have clothing, so textiles were a key industry in this time period. Whatever the case, it remains here today almost unchanged. Falconhurst is also connected to the composer Charles Faulkner Bryan. He was born in 1911 and was raised as part of the Faulkner and Bryan family. Uh, Falconhurst is what he considered home and he lived here for many years. Brian and his brothers and a cousin formed what they called the Pirates Trapping Company. They gave themselves pirate nicknames and they had a boat that they used up and down Charles Creek. They trapped possums and muskrats. Uh, mostly this would have been adventures for young boys growing up in rural Tennessee. At the same time as he was playing around the mills here, he began to hear music. One of his earliest pieces of music he wrote down was at the age of 14 and called Symphony One. That was very ambitious of him because he expected there would be a symphony too somewhere later on. But what's amazing is this is the melody of Amazing Grace. The title of the tune is called New Britain, but we call it Amazing Grace. And if you look at the way it's written, it's written in an old mountain singing style that we would associate with Deep in the Hollers. He heard that around here and he wrote it down the way he heard it being sung at the time. Later on, this exact melody be, would be used in the second movement of his White Spiritual Symphony. Part of Brian's life was not just as a musician, but as a preserver and as a collector of folklore. He was a key part of the early days of the Tennessee Folklore Society. Part of his goal as a musician was not just to create sounds to listen to, but to preserve the melodies, preserve the words. He had a conviction that our songs here in Tennessee were, in his words, as fine as any in the world. He felt that a folk song from right here in Middle Tennessee had as much right to be in the concert hall as a German melody or an English folk song. One of his earliest works was called White Spiritual Symphony. 
He was associated with a man named George Pullen Jackson, who was known as an early collector of what were called white spirituals in this area. And he took those melodies and felt that they should be put into a concert form for the concert hall. He also found a collection called Songs of the Old Campground by Lucian L. McDowell. The old campground is up near Quebec, Tennessee at an old church. And in this area, they had camp meetings during the 1800s. And someone wrote down all the melodies that were sung at these camp meetings. Brian had this collection and combined with his knowledge of the melodies and his work with George Pullen Jackson, he decided to write a symphony. He worked hard on this and eventually the middle movement, the second movement, was premiered under the, the baton of Eugene Goosens, the conductor, at Cincinnati in 1942. It's not been performed much. Uh, there are very few ensembles that are capable of performing that music. In each movement of White Spiritual Symphony, you hear melodies that are gonna be recognizable. They're not major and they're not minor. They're what we call modal melodies. They sound medieval to us because that's the origins of some of these musical styles. Brian preserved them, and he didn't just want to use the musical style of the melody. He wanted to make sure that you heard the original melody. So you would recognize tunes like Wondrous Love, where we sing the words, What wondrous love is this, O my soul? You hear the tune New Britain that we call Amazing Grace. And I have a father in the promised land. All of these melodies that he put into this symphony occurred within 30 miles of this location. Rock Island, here in McMinnville, all the places that he was as a child running up and down the creek, he heard these melodies and they became part of his music. Later on, he won a Guggenheim Fellowship as a composer. He did a musical setting of a poem called Ballad of the Harp Weaver. And he was awarded a fellowship where he would have enough money to spend time in what he wanted to be a secluded cabin and spend time composing music. We don't know where that cabin is, but he had the audacity to tell the Guggenheim Foundation, thank you for the award, can we wait a year before you give it to me? Instead, he went to Yale University and studied for a year with the composer Paul Hindemith, a German composer who had fled World War II and come to America. During that time, he began work on another piece of music, and we come to the Bell Witch Cantata. As a collector of folk song and a preserver of folklore, Brian had a conviction that all folklore, all knowledge was important. And we have this wonderful story of the Bell Witch throughout Tennessee. We've all heard it growing up. Sometimes it was a ghost story to scare us. Sometimes it was history. There's different versions of it, but it's one of the best documented paint tales in American history. Even Andrew Jackson himself came to investigate it and witness things he could not explain. Brian took a story in which Nancy Bell, the main character, wants to go to a party. Like any teenager, she wants to go have a good time with her friends, and like any dad, her father, John Bell, does not want her to go and get into too much trouble. While she's gone, the witch gets her. See, John Bell knew something bad was happening but he couldn't put his foot finger on it and tell her what it was. She goes to the party anyway, and while she's there, she faints dead away, as the lyrics say in the song. John Bell is pleading for his daughter's life. And while this is happening, the crowd at the dance becomes a choir, and they sing one of the old shape note gospel songs that Brian had heard so many of growing up. But this one is probably an original tune that he wrote. The other element of Brian was he was a Christian. He was a member of First Baptist Church. And here he is telling the story of a witch who wins. But throughout this story, evil is never allowed to speak. Not one time is the witch given a voice in the Bell Witch Cantata. How important was this? It premiered at Carnegie Hall with the Juilliard Chorus and Orchestra. We're happy to have all of these things in the museum, and and uh, we have uh, photographs of Charles Bryan uh, playing the auto harp in one of his mountain dulcimers that he collected. He had an enormous collection of dulcimers. Most of those now are at Tennessee Tech in Cookville, um, along with his piano that he had 
and uh, <clears throat> Falconhurst at Faulkner Springs. In 1994, Chris Keithley, who was one of the students of Edith, his widow, uh, w went out to Falconhurst and photographed her and photographed the house, the famous house built in 1850. And a lot of the antique furniture and his piano, his rosewood piano that you can see in the photograph down here in the bottom and a lot of his dulcimers and local instruments. Um, and um, after she died um, in the 90s, um, the house was broken up and finally the house was sold to Roy Davis, the uh, former manager of Cumberland Caverns who lives there now. Well, hello and uh, welcome to the Falconhurst House. We are, uh, my name is Wendy Curran and I'm going to be interviewing Mr. Roy Davis and he's going to actually take us around this beautiful home and show us many of the beautiful qualities that are here and all the renovations that he's beautifully doing and also some of the antiques as well. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the dining room, Mr. Davis? <clears throat> well, first of all, this was the uh, this has always been the dining room as far as we know and this room is one that has not been restored uh, the the wall coverings and, and woodwork and everything is original the table was the original asa faulkner table uh, the chairs are not uh, i found i could could buy these beautiful chairs cheaper than i could refinish the uh, the uh, original ones it's an oak table and uh, it seats 10 and and i always need to seat 13. I don't <laughs> that's that always way. the way <laughs> right, right. and most of the furniture furnishings in here are except for the table are reproductions except for the beautiful armoire on the far side of the room and it came from an old house down in savannah that it is, is a, a very beautiful piece and huge. as you can see just barely fits in the space allowed for it now this is rather grand <laughs> it's well, such a surprise Trying to keep the, the decorations in, in, in keeping with the, uh, the uh, time period. And it was the Federalist, Federalist style architecture. And this type of uh, furnishings would have been appropriate for, for a, a house like this. I really don't know what Asa Faulkner actually had, but, but uh, I, the, the table certainly speaks of, of uh, downstairs, certainly speaks of an opulent uh, furnishing. Yes, and the armoire in the, in, the in the next bedroom. This table, by the way, I found in the attic. It was minus its legs and all in pieces. And, and uh, then when I was cleaning up, I found the legs. And so I put it all back together. And the ball and claw. Yeah, the ball, ball and claw. And a beautiful ball, like a crystal. Very nice. And the fireplace, of course, is replaced, but it almost looks authentic. Well, there was never a fireplace in this room. Uh, uh, the two back bedrooms did not have fireplaces. And the, the front ones did. And so... I put this in to uh, serve the purpose and, and I got away with it pretty well, I think. Mm. And, and of course, you can't, your eye cannot leave this room without looking at that beautiful bed. That is beautiful. It's a half tester bed, and I searched high and low to find that. Everything in here is reproduction. There are no antiques in here, including the, the uh, four post, uh, the canopy bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the canopy cost more than the bed did. <laughs> I had a lady here in town do the, the uh, draperies and the and the and the and the canopy for the bed and be sure to get a picture of the uh, crown on top. I was going to say I, I'm, I'm going to ask the cameraman to look through the, the mirror here and he'll see the crown on the top if he if he can get a shot of that that's that's rather unique <laughs> Perhaps you could give us a little uh, story on what that's up there for and, and if there's a story to it. Well, um, when I had the canopy made, I told the lady I knew that in, in, in uh, medieval times, the kings would carry their tents out in battle and the pennons waving on the tops of the tents and so forth. And that's what I wanted with my, my uh, canopy for the bed. And so she did that for me. And then I thought, well, it still needs something. And so I decided to put a crown on it. And so the crown is uh, a piece of chandelier on the bottom, um, a child's plastic crown, two, two of those stapled together with the jewels in them, and then um, a, some, some uh, waste aluminum banding for the top part, and uh, colored cloth in, in between which is held in place by newspapers, and then on top of that is this uh, Christmas ornament. So there's the crown. <laughs> the balcony. 
That's King Tut. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, where did you find him? Same place I find these other reproductions. Uh, in Ch- the, the company, unfortunately, in Chattanooga that supplied all these things is now out of business. And I'm so sorry because I, I would like to get more. But I'm lucky that I, I hoarded them when I was, buy- was able to get them. And, and I didn't have the rooms finished, but I bought stuff well in advance. And so that's how I furnished so much of this stuff. It's actually a, a CD cabinet. It, it contains... Oh, oh did music. you convert it? Or? No, no, that's, no, it was that's, already that's, like that. Well, I never. Let's go through into here. Oh, another bedroom. Oh, oh, my word, how beautiful. Oh, look at that bed for poster. This bed is also an antique and, and came from an, uh, an old house in, in, in Knoxville, I understand. And, uh, and the armoire, our wardrobe behind mm-hmm. me, is original. This was the Ace of Faulkner furniture. And beautiful uh, walnut uh, wood, solid walnut. walnut. And uh, they just didn't have room in their house anywhere to put it, and so they left it, and I was delighted with it. Mm. Wonderful. And this has all been totally redecorated, I can see, and very nicely. I love the fireplace around, and the fireplace looks beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Do you have many guests come visit you? Not a great many, although I had some this past week, and... and, uh, when you arrived this evening, I didn't have the beds made, so I had to scurry them. <laughs> <laughs> the well, that's the whole point of having a maid. <laughs> at, least, at least I had more. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Can we go through into another room? This is exciting. Room after room after room. Now, would this have been the original balcony? Yes. Mm, it's not been added on since. Oh, how nice. Oh, it's very crisp out here this evening. Yes, it felt so warm inside. Very nice. And this is the Bellwitch uh, broom port, if you want to call it her landing spot. <laughs> <laughs> and is that the water I'm hearing over there? Yes. That is? The original dam is still over there, and that's the water pouring over it. Oh. Of course, the water's medium now. When oh. it's really heavy, you can really hear it roar. And uh, Asa Faulkner was a... When he was a young man, he, he, he worked for a... Miller, uh, in a in a in a water powered mill somewhere, and uh, uh, he liked what he was doing, and and soon he owned the mill, and then he uh, came to to uh, Faulkner Springs here, and built a mill on Charles Creek just across the road from here, and so so his business was was milling and and mostly uh, uh, wooden wool, woolen woolen mills and 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 cloth manufacturing as opposed to to uh, grain and, and, and corn and so forth. But uh, he, he had something to do with practically every brick, every old brick built home in the county and in the neighboring county. Um, the um, mill at Faulkner, uh, at uh, Rock Island, he built. Oh. And, and he was, uh, uh, and his milling was very successful. He made lots of money doing this. In fact, I have a, a, a publication upstairs, uh, one of his speeches, and he tells you how to get rich. And the thing you do is you go out and find a, a, a stream you can dam and, and, and put in a water wheel for free power. And of course today with, with electricity and, and uh, other means of power, we don't think about water, but it was the, uh, the secret back, it was his secret in making money. And well, we've actually covered the house and we've covered the grounds and we've covered the history. But I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself. I do believe you were involved in, in Cumberland Caverns and who better to ask than someone like yourself? Could you tell us a little bit? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Yankee. Came from Indiana in 1952 to go to college at David Lipscomb in Nashville. And... Uh, among other things in Indiana, I was interested in cave exploring. I belonged to the National Speleological Society, and, and I was 18, mind you. And uh, um, hadn't been in Nashville long before I heard about a big cave near McMinnville called Higginbottom Cave, where a, a 17-year-old high school boy had fallen and was killed. So, so just morbid teenage curiosity brought me here first uh, to see the cave the kid got killed in. And... Totally unexpectedly, we found the cave to be so much bigger, so much more interesting. Uh, indeed, the most exciting cave I had ever seen. And so I just fell hopelessly in love with Higginbottom Cave and was here every weekend. Um, the uh, man who owned the cave was concerned about me because he thought I, 
he thought I might be a communist since he couldn't imagine why anybody would come every weekend and would make a map of his cave. Oh. <laughs> and, and yes, and, and we were, uh, of course, in, uh, exploring the cave systematically and trying to understand it. And in 1953, we discovered some seven miles of virgin cave in Hagenbottom Cave. And every kid dreams of walking on virgin soil where man has never been before. And, and we had that thrill at that time, and it's been repeated several times since I got associated here. And we eventually uh, were able to lease the cave from the, the landowners and, and opened it in 1956, and we've been here ever since. Among the fun things of, of doing this was we didn't know anything about developing a cave. Uh, uh, I had done a lot of theater. That was my major in college, speech and drama. I did a lot of theater. And uh, so I knew something about uh, the dramatic, and, and uh, especially in the matter of placing lights. And so we um, lighted the cave, and, and we needed to blast in a couple of instances. And we couldn't find anybody who knew anything about that sort of thing. And, and finally, we got the DuPont Blaster's Handbook on How to Blast. And uh, in, in short, we lit the fuse and ran like the Dickens and came back a few minutes later and there was a pile of gravel where there had been a big rock before and, and uh, uh, did what was necessary to get the cave open to the public. And as I say, it opened in 1956 and has slowly grown for the past 50 years to the point where now it's, it's a, a viable um, tourist attraction. Unfortunately, Warren County is not uh, a tourist area. And so uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult getting people up here, and promotion is the main thing that we need to accomplish that. But at any rate, since I had been doing this for 50-some years, uh, uh, this, this March, I sold my interest in the cave uh, to friends uh, who, who uh, incidentally, are the people who operate Dollywood. And uh, uh, we're already seeing great things that they're beginning to do. They have no plans to turn this into another Dollywood. It's, it's a matter of... of uh, developing a cave as a cave should be developed and indeed uh, Jack Hershen who is the man involved. But later I learned about the theater pipe organ that's in the Tivoli Theater in Chattanooga and other cities and uh, I put one of those together in my home that burned uh, and played and enjoyed it for some 25 years out of the cave and now I'm getting ready to put one here in Falconhurst and, and if I live long enough we'll have one playing in time. And so, so many people in, in the county know me as the organ man, and, and uh, I used to play a lot at the fair and, and various places around town and, and horse shows and that type of thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a passion. It's, it's just a delightful thing to do, and I enjoy it immensely. Asa Faulkner and Charles Faulkner Bryan, their footprint of their lives was at this house and on this land. Bryan himself, just over here at the dam where the mill stood, uh, spotted a turtle one day. He killed the turtle, then built a fire and burned out the inside of the shell, took an old coffee can and made what he called his turtle uke. You can see this even to this day in the collection in the Bryan Fine Arts Building at Tennessee Tech where Bryan taught at one time. Uh, he believed that the melodies that we sang here, the stories we tell, the, the cultural beliefs we hold, were worthy of preserving. Uh, he felt that his history was as important as anyone else's history in the world. And he would have looked at any one of us and said the same thing. Find out what your story is and tell your story. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Tennessee Stories of Home. My name is Charles Priest, and we invite you to join us on our website, communitytvtn.com, or email us at communitytvtn at gmail.com. Every home has a story. What's your story?